Um, so Repair the World is an organization dedicated to creating stronger communities by making volunteer work and direct service a normative part of Jewish American life. Uh, we work with 11 partner organizations, which are listed on a flyer on the resource table, um, and also help put on events like this to raise awareness, discussion, and action around issues affecting our community. I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement, acknowledging that this event is being held on the seized territory of the Lenny Lenape people who have stewarded this, stewarded this land for generations. We are so thrilled to be partnering with March for Our Lives Philadelphia and Habunin Jarakan Filio for the Art of Gun Reform. The hashtag is Art of Gun Reform without the article. Thanks, Molly. <laughs> Um, inspired by Global Citizens Dreamline Boots, which is an art project that imagines a world without gun violence through fabric panels, we wanted to highlight art's role in healing, resistance, and act activism and awareness around gun violence and gun reform in Philadelphia. We're so grateful to Roz, Zerbi, Juan, and Anissa for donating all of the amazing art in the other room, and there'll be time afterwards. Yeah, thank you. All the artists who have. All right, so if folks like have questions about the art or want to talk about it, those are the artists. Um, we have a super engaging panel for, for you tonight with Anissa Wheeler White, Lataj Carter, and Roz Picardo, moderated by Grace and Alex, who are March for Our Lives students. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Before we go to the panel, we'll hear a poem from Anissa, and then Habunim Jura Kim Kalia will tell us a little bit about the work that they've been doing this year um, and lead us in a little and get to know your neighbor exercise. After the panel, there will be some time for reflection and questions for the panelists, um, and more time to look at the exhibit, eat some more food, schmooze a little bit, get to know who's here, um, and also create art for the dream booth. I don't know if folks saw, but there are a bunch of blank panels over there in our dream booth. We only have one row of panels, so please feel free to make some art. Since the beginning of 2019, there have been 134 victims of gun violence in Philadelphia. Before we begin our program, I'd like to invite you to join me in a moment of silence for the victims and also the countless number of people that this violence has uh, touched. in the book that I made um, that's displayed. <coughs> black people are only armed with black skin. I don't know if this is the armor I want to be in. Our elders say beauty is melanin, but this beauty has brought on great destruction. Wine against melanin may be great for a painting, but white supremacists only see it as an extermination for their reign in. Society taught me how to be my culture, race, and how to wear my face. The face with the mouth that yearns to talk volumes to those one and the same on the opposite side of the scale. This scale tells the tale of how many of our black brothers and sisters were set up to fail. We know what they did, no need to repeat what's been said and prove this fact. But they throw these out the window when they're ready to attack. Attack me for the skin I'm in. Why do I feel trapped, discouraged with my melanin? Feeling defeated before the human race even began. I don't think I feel like repeating myself all over again. But we have white supremacy in the front seat too busy on their phone. The minorities in the back seat just trying to live another day and get home. The same crash, the same burn, but no. This time we will grab the wheel and make the turn. Okay, and anyone can answer. So our first question is, who or what was the greatest inspiration for your artwork? Oh, um, my greatest inspiration was my dad because the first line of black people are our only arm of black skin came from him. Like we had like a lot of talks in his car and me and my dad really close. He was just like he babbles on a lot sometimes. He's like, you know what, black people only arm of black skin. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. Like <laughs> it's not copyright because it's when I can use it. <laughs> 
My inspiration for my art was feeling the need or the impulse to express how I was feeling or what I was seeing. And it's been so long that I didn't really express myself. I just kept on myself and did my thing. But then there was so much going on in my life that I finally decided to say how I felt about it and spoke on how I felt. Mm, let's see, inspiration for art. I guess it would be um, a woman that I work with uh, by the name of uh, Catherine Pennebacker. She's a textile artist here in Philadelphia. Um, we started the Healing Blanket Project together um, when we were working with families of homicide victims and kind of sitting around the table and weaving and just creating beautiful pieces. What does the world without gun violence look like to you? Different. Because <laughs> like guns is heavily based in America, so imagining a world without guns is like a whole complete 180. It's just like something that, it's like a dream and a wish that you hope for it, but you know that it's not gonna happen probably not in your lifetime, but you know it might happen soon. You hope to be able to see, see that come to. World without guns. I actually uh, drew an art piece of it for the, for the dream line. It was, the art was a bullet casing, but it was seen as a museum piece to show that in a world without guns, guns, although they may have existed in that world before, there's efforts and attempts to prevent gun violence so much so that bullets and guns become archaic or ancient. And so I believe that a world without guns would be a world that improve upon itself and realize the danger and effects of the gun violence and finally achieve preventing gun violence. That's the world without gun violence. I guess for me it would be beautiful, you know. Um, beautiful on so many levels. Like um, I would have my brother, he's no longer here because he's been murdered. My twin sister to suicide. So I would be feel a lot of love if, if there were no guns. I guess I'll feel whole again, you know. Okay, so a follow-up question is, what is your relationship with gun violence? Um, my relationship is it happened frequently where I live because when I used to be outside a lot, you know, before you get to high school, <laughs> when I used to be outside a lot and kind of late at night, um, the park we used to go to that I don't really go to anymore, my mom doesn't let my sister go to anymore, they would kind of like shoot in the like perimeter of it. And then I know once I heard the gunshot, my dad would hear it too. They'd call me like a second later and say, where are you? You need to get home. Are you okay? And it was just like, when I, before I really didn't think about it, but like my dad has a lot of a lot of history with gun violence because he's doing the product, projects in um, Philadelphia. And he always like, kind of like, I can feel his anxiety through the phone, but I've never actually felt to myself. And then I realized that, yeah, I'm not my dad feeling anxiety and I'm not gonna keep, I'm gonna do something about that. I can't even let my parents live with this anxiety of having to deal with me and my sister coming outside. My relationship with gun violence is somewhat of an average uh, relationship. I uh, was seeing on the news, hear about it from other people. It was that I heard about it so much that I finally decided to address it and see if there was a way I could prevent it. The most with my relationship with gun violence is my brother. He's um, often he's gone in and out of prison and part of the street life or whatever. And there were times when I hear about him using guns or someone dying because of guns. And I just didn't really, I didn't want to hear anymore because I knew how detrimental it was, not just to people, but to communities as well. So again, my relationship to gun violence is, um, at 16, I became a, a survivor of an attempted homicide. Um, and at that time, my, um, boyfriend Tower Jackson was murdered by my ex-boyfriend 2000 and 2000 my twin sister Kathleen Pichardo um, died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound and in 2012 um, I lost my brother Alexander Martinez to murder in the streets of Philadelphia and currently my relationship to gun violence now is just really um, being the voice of many moms and sisters and cousins and neighbors in my community, just being that voice for, for those who are no longer here. Uh, 
why do you use art as a form of activism? And uh, what do you hope will happen as a result? Um, I use art as a form of activism because I know that sometimes I'm not good with words and I know that my art is better at speaking. And when I get into the sense of poetry, I can say what I want to without actually fully saying it and let people interpret it the way they want to so they can connect with it for themselves and not just know my story. I want everyone else to be able to connect with their own story. The use of art and activism is almost, it's almost like fueling a revolution. If anyone has ever taken note on the history of activism and revolutions, they seen that there's art that supports it, not just in a way where someone uh, attesting to the power of it, but also they're almost literally adding fuel to the fire. They're inspiring the revolution to expand and be more effective. And I think the use of art and activism can achieve, they can achieve more people to participate, to take attention and finally act on gun violence not just by acknowledging it, but also by literally taking action. What was the question? <laughs> Why do you use art as a form of activism, and what do you hope will happen as a result of your artwork? Um, I use art <clears throat> as a form of healing. Um, like I said, I work with Catherine Pinnepacker, another artist in Philly, and just being able to bring families together, just working on a piece, you know, working with color, work, working with fabric, it's just something healing about speaking, expressing, and just creating together. Okay, next question. Why do you believe it is important to approach problems from a variety of mediums in order to make change? Can you repeat the question? Yes. Why do you believe it is important to approach problems from a variety of mediums in order to make change? So like words, or like speeches, that kind of thing. Instead of just one. Yes, people express themselves in different ways, so we use different things. Okay, that's what And also, there's which medium is the most effective way of reaching specific or certain people. There may be people that learn or pay attention more to music, where some, it may be even a painting or a simple mural. Mm -hmm. And I think the variety of mediums maximizes the, it maximizes the effect of using art. I feel like different forms of mediums, like on the top says, speaks to different people. And that is like, if you, if you see it a number of times, you realize maybe it actually is like something important. Because you can see on the news, you can see, you can hear songs, you can see pieces, you can hear poems. Once you keep hearing it over and over again, you need to realize that there's something a problem. You don't hear things over and over again, so you have to find it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite piece that you've made and why? <laughs> you can take a minute, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> I think my favorite piece would be the bullhorn with the shell casings. Um, because when I was putting that piece together, I felt like um, that just using each shell casing can represent a family that I've that I've helped um, and the bloodshed that was that was shed, but that through the bullhorn I can be the voice, or just passing the bullhorn to a mother, how she can be the voice, and just having that platform so people can be that voice, but just representing a lot of different folks. My favorite piece might be my poem, because it's something different. I just started writing poetry a couple months ago, and like, I know before I would never get words, but I know something just surged through me, just keep writing poems. And I realized that I'm starting to progress within myself. And I realized that I'm, I can do this, I can spread what I know in more than one way. And that poem, like, I just like, before I just kept like, it started with that one line, and then random times me going to school, coming out of school, I would just like randomly add lines to it, and it came together somehow. So like, it's something that I kind of pulled out of me, something that I didn't know that I had. Because I know I talk about gun violence a lot, but I never knew that I could put it into a way where people can understand, people can like make it and interpret it in their own way. <laughs> there's, there's this one piece that did come to mind that kind of relates to gun violence. There was a piece I made about maybe two years ago. I was personifying summer as death. Like, every time summer comes, there's usually an uprising of death, specifically with 
gun violence or homicides. I remember writing that piece and just feeling that not only did the method of personifying someone was effective, but it also made people think. And it also inspired them to not only think about it, but to also <coughs> share their feeling or reaction or share something that they can do to prevent homicide and gun violence. Awesome. All right. Um, <clears throat> what memorable responses have you had from sharing your work? Oh, um, when I started getting more into activism, I met a, a wonderful group of women called Moth Bonded by Grief. They are amazing women. Hearing different stories, and you can always hear about a death and someone who died, but you never hear about someone whoever was directly affected by it right after. And hearing about hearing these stories from these women and how they're trying to move on, how they're all very tight and helping each other, it's like there's another side to every point, and this is the other side. And like watching these women persevere, it's like if they can do it, then I should be able to do anything too. <laughs> a memorable response that I've had to my art was there was a one weekend when I sometimes during the summer or during any time in the weekends I would go to a workshop held by Joanne Pugh, the Philly Youth Poetry Movement. And I remember one time I shared my piece of art with everyone in the room, seeing as though we're all comfortable with each other, we're all safe within each other. I shared my art and everyone was telling me that it, not only was it really dull, but it was also inspiring, thoughtful, and I think a response such as that is really memorable because it's not just one person or a few people, but it's almost, it's a variety of people from different demographics, with different experiences, and to have such responses towards a piece of art is really memorable. See, so my most memorable, I guess would be when when I created this piece with a, it was with a casket, um, full size casket with bullet shell casings um, at a funeral home and we put this thing together so families can walk through. Um, one, one casket we had the healing blanket draped over the casket and the other casket we would, had it filled with shell casings and throughout the funeral home we had about 400 pictures of folks who've been murdered in Philly and families got to walk through this funeral home. Um, not to mourn, but more like connect. And we got to talk about which cases were solved and unsolved and how we kind of zoomed on this one family, uh, Lisa Espinosa, and her son, RJ, was murdered. And we had determined that that was gonna be the day that we all got together to help this mom solve her cases, although some of our cases weren't solved. And we pushed it so hard that three months after the murder, the case was solved. Mm -hmm. um, Todd, you're talking about a youth organization. Why, why do you feel it's important to empower youth? It's important to empower youth because who do you think will be walking around the streets tomorrow? Who do you think will be directly affected by whatever happens in this world tomorrow? Or even today, really. Because the youth, they have so much potential to do more. And not only that, but there was something that I learned from one of my math teachers during my high school years. He taught me Y equals X, MX plus B. Now that's a slope and set form equation. He put it in realistic terms and he said, Y is the youth everything else, MX are the parents, but plus B is what makes Y more or better. And he made a math equation become a real thing, and that, that, that became a inspiration, and something that I thought of for why the youth are important and why it's so important to inspire and encourage the youth to do more than what we do now. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> it is important to power the youth because um, I work with kids a lot. I do community service with kids. I like. I love working with work with kids. I know where people my age are in, like it's just just kids, and I see that they're oblivious to a lot of things. And it's I love to see them so happy, and I have to know about certain things. But it's like soon enough they're gonna have to know, and they're gonna have their own trial and tribulation that they have to go to and their own fights to go ahead and fight. 
And it's like, if we empower them now, they're more prepared for that fight than how a lot of us are when we prepare for this fight now. Because a lot of us weren't ready for it, and a lot of us were like, we need to hurry buckle down. And it's kind of like, it hurts more to the line when you realize how important what you're doing. But if you empower them now, they have more confidence going into this fight and they have more drive and, and more passion.